Good afternoon. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, great. Well, welcome. I know it's a little windy, it's a little chilly, and it's a little rainy, but thank you all to those who are here in person to join us for our last Research Without Borders session of the 2013-14 academic year, and uh, welcome to all those who are um, joining us on the webcast. My name is Pamela Graham, and I work in the libraries as the director of our Global Studies Division. It's really a pleasure to be moderating this theme um, on open access in the Americas is very close to my heart, so I, I hesitated for not a second when I was asked if I could moderate today's session. Um, and this series has been really wonderful throughout the year. It's co-sponsored by the Scholarly Communication Program of the Center for Digital Research and Scholarship and the Digital Humanities Centers, both in the Columbia University Libraries. Um, today we have um, a, a great program that will cross borders, uh, not only perhaps in disciplinary or in methodological ways, but across countries, across the different countries in the Americas, and we've assembled a really great lineup of speakers. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce all the speakers at once, and then they'll each have a chance to give their comments for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll open things up for questions, um, both from the audience and who's, who's here in person and those who are joining us via the webcast. Um, so uh, the speakers will talk in the order that I'm introducing them. And first we'll, we'll have Heather Joseph, who is the Executive Director of the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, known as SPARC, one of the best acronyms, by the way, in the worlds of libraries and publishing, and one of my favorites. Um, Heather is also the convener of the Alliance for Taxpayer Access and serves on the board of the Public Library of Science. She recently completed a term as the elected president of the Society for Scholarly, excuse me, Scholarly Publishing. And then next we have Michael Sinatra, who is an associate professor of English at the University of Montreal and the president of the Canadian Society for Digital Humanities. He's also president of Synergies, the Canadian Information Network for Research in the Social Sciences and Humanities, and a founding member of the Steering Committee of NINES. That's also a pretty good acronym. Um, and that stands for the Networked Infrastructure for 19th Century Electronic Scholarship. And then finally, joining us um, via um, a recorded presentation and also joining us via Skype for the question and answer period is Dominique Babini, who is the Open Access Program Coordinator at CLACSO, the Latin American Council on Social Sciences, and a scholarly communications researcher at the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, in Argentina. She's also on the Experts Committee of the Argentine National System of Digital Repositories and a consultant for the UNESCO Global Open Access Portal. Um, just a few quick housekeeping details. Um, when we open things up to the question and answer period, we will have a microphone circulating and we ask that you use the microphone so that your voice can be picked up for our webcast and our recording. And I also want to remind you that we do have a hashtag for this event. It's uh, hashtag RWOB. So if you like to uh, follow the discussion uh, on Twitter, please use that hashtag so that your tweets can be found and, and followed. So with that, let me um, turn things over to Heather for our first, uh, first presentation. Thank you very much. Make sure you guys can hear me. I'm struggling a little bit getting over a cold, so I apologize in advance for the torch singer quality that my, uh, my voice might have today. Uh, although it might be an improvement over my normal voice. Who, who can really say? Um, it's really an honor to be on a panel with both Michael and Dominique, who are both idols of mine in uh, the open access space, and a pleasure and a privilege to be with you all um, here today. Thank you very much for including me in this program. Um, my presentation, my remarks are, are really going to focus on trying to give you an overview of the, um, the evolution of open access policies here in the United States and uh, really how it's evolved uh, uh, into a, a real uh, beginning, at least, of a solid framework uh, that we're feeling more and more confident as time goes by will serve to um, uh, allow us to really move forward um, into the open access uh, landscape in the United States. Um, hang on one second here. I'm going to kind of do two things at one time. There we go. Um, in terms of drivers for open access policy in the United States, we have a very sort of interesting 
uh, set of circumstances that have that have put this on the radar screen, sort of front and center of policymakers over the last decade. And I think first and foremost, oops, there we go, the the, the sheer scope of the investment that the U.S. federal government makes in supporting re research, not just um, scientific research applied in basic scientific research, but research in all disciplines, is upward of about $60 billion annually. And the expectations that go along with this investment in research are pretty gigantic, right? And they're pretty um, aspirational. We invest in research of all kinds, right? So new ideas can be generated, so that new discoveries can be uncovered, and that subsequently our collective understanding of the world and our interactions with it in all disciplines will be enhanced and improved. But this can only happen if the results of the research that's con that is conducted can not only be accessed, right, and read, but also used and built on. And the working theory and the sort of policy environment is that policies that encourage open access to the results of this research will accelerate and significantly improve the expected outcomes of, of research. And the outcomes of research aren't just the theoretical. Right? We sort of have this granular, more and more granular idea of what will happen if we enable um, open access to the results of research of all kinds. That besides stimulating new ideas and accelerating discovery, right, the, the, the improved accessibility and utility of the results of research of all kind will also be fed into our educational system and help us improve educational outcomes. That the faster and the more freely we have access to the results of research, the more innovation can be fueled in a variety of different ways, right? The faster you can turn ideas into new products, new services, uh, things that can be built upon. And that subsequently can help grow national economies, help create jobs. And all of these in turn feed into improving the welfare of the public. So these are very, I mean, it's very hard to say you're against open access, right? When these are the outcomes that you're, that you're working towards. And I think that being able to articulate these potential benefits has really allowed us to have a set of policymakers on both sides of the political spectrum in the United States, um, whether we're talking conservative Republicans or liberal Democrats. This is not a partisan issue in the US. The policy building around these concepts um, have been remarkably bipartisan for the, you know, the 2000s. Um, we, we see policymakers in the U.S. increasingly recognizing the need to not attack this piecemeal, but rather to create a framework that supports all of the stakeholders that contribute to and benefit from greater access to the results of research um, in the transition to creating a systematic way to more openly share the results of the research that we, that we um, produce. In policy circles, um, as I'm sure, is the same in Canada as in Latin America, precedent is always important, right? No policymaker likes to build a policy in a vacuum. And in the US, we're very lucky that we have a firm uh, set of constructs that have allowed us to articulate a very clear um, precedent for open access policies. And I promise you I'm not gonna bore you and go through each one of these things. The one that's in red is the one that we're gonna focus on. But the, everything from the Copyright Act to the Freedom of Information Act through uh, the Government Paperwork Elimination Act, as stunningly exciting as that sounds, actually provide us with, with um, wonderful uh, foundational language and um, uh, precedent for the move towards sharing government, federal-generated, taxpayer-generated information. But this little innocuous OMB Circular A130 is probably the most important piece of documentation in terms of pulling language out to construct effective open access policies in the United States that we have. Um, and it says two things, very simply, that we've really used to, um, to build the framework of open access policies. And the first is that the, the, the policy, the, the circular states that government information of all kinds, not just the results of research, but information writ large, is a valuable national resource, and that the economic benefits to society is maximized when you do a very simple thing, when you make it available, accessible to the public in a timely and equitable manner. And additionally, the circular goes on to use this phrase, open and unrestricted access to public information at no more than the cost of dissemination 
is the key to making this information uh, uh, more valuable to the public. So that's great language, right? And that's language that comes directly out of U.S. policy uh, and, and U.S. policy that's in wide use across the federal government. I'm sorry, I should have been clicking that. Um, uh, what's nice to know is that it feeds into international precedents that are being set, not just in the Americas, but actually a, 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 a across the world. The Interna International Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, has also built language that echoes these kinds of policy constructs that are in use already in the U.S. Um, and in a statement on examining the outputs of publicly funded research across OECD members in 2005, so almost a decade ago, the OECD echoed this notion of constructing uh, an, an op a system based on open sharing of research results for the purpose of um, maximizing returns on the public investment. So the precedent is wonderful, um, and it's really led in the U.S. to us being able to construct a very solid policy focus and framework, um, which I'll talk about next, and I'll also uh, tell you a bit about some key milestones that have occurred in, in actually implementing uh, open policy in the U.S. So the policy construct that we've settled on, and that is widely accepted across the U.S. government is the, the simple construct that the public is entitled to access and to use the results of research that their tax dollars have paid for. Um, and results of research, scientific research, humanities research, social sciences research is defined not only as the articles reporting on that research, but um, the data that those articles uh, that, that result from that research as well. And I think that broad interpretation as the basis of policy is increasingly important in the open access policy environment in the United States and across uh, the Americas and indeed the world. It's taken about a decade for policies supporting this simple statement to be developed, adopted, and finally implemented. I'm the world's most impatient human being and I can remember advocating for open access policy starting in 2002 and having a, a staffer on Capitol Hill say to me, I was like, I wanna bill pass tomorrow and she's like, well, five to seven years is the average time it takes from introduction to passage of legislation in the United States. And I was like, I don't have that kind of time. What are, what are people kidding me? Uh, and little did I know that that's probably a conservative estimate. Um, you sort of learn uh, if, if, uh, you know, if, if one year is seven years to a dog, there's some, there's some analogy that we need to make about policy development here. <laughs> Working at dog years for policy development. But happily, we have made progress and milestones have occurred. And it started with one federal agency. You know, it started slowly, but a big agency. The first agency uh, to successfully implement and a policy uh, for open access was the U.S. National Institutes of Health. And it's a big one because the, the NIH funds roughly half, 30 billion of our total 60 billion in investment in publicly funded research each year. Uh, so not a small, uh, a small step to, to take. Um, and the, the, the NIH's odyssey towards implementing an open access policy started in 2004, so started quite some time ago, um, with just report language that Congress issued that went along with a bill, not bill language, not a requirement, but merely an observation by the U.S. Congress that the committee that funded the NIH was concerned about the status, the state of the public's ability to access reports and data resulting from NIH-funded research, right? Nothing earth-shaking, simply a statement um, of concern. And the NIH subsequently piloted a voluntary open access uh, policy to attempt to address this committee's concern for a three-year period. Right? This was the source of my impatience, right? Was, well, we see there's a problem. We, we have language that could be a solution. Why don't we just do it? Congress rarely just does anything, as we know. Um, but. NIH piloted a voluntary uh, open access policy for three years. That word voluntary is in red for, for a reason, right? So the policy that was piloted uh, for all intents and purposes asked researchers who took money from the NIH to do research to consider, a request, not require, uh, making copies of reports that reported on that research publicly accessible online in NIH's digital repository. Um, and that word request was something we were very concerned that active researchers, no matter what your discipline is, that if we simply ask you, 
if you think about it when you're done. Hey, could you possibly make a copy of your article available? Uh, we were pretty sure it wasn't going to make the to-do list of many researchers when there was no real consequence to doing it or not doing it. Um, and that, in fact, was uh, the case. Less than 5% of all eligible researchers complied with NIH's request. So Congress took a step, a big change, um, in January of 2008 and changed one word of the policy to requiring funded researchers, to saying it's a condition of funding. Now if you take money, we're not just asking nicely, we're telling you that you need to do this. We think that the return on investment is important enough to do this. Um, and were they right? We think so. They think so. As a result of the, the mandatory policy, there are now over three million articles available in NIH's open access repository reporting on its funded research, accessed by more than a million unique users each and every day. And what's amazing is it's about 80% of all funded NIH researchers, so compliance is, is pretty high up there. Um, Two-thirds of the folks who use that database come from the general public. They don't come from people at academic institutions uh, that you might have expected to be the largest user. There's a new audience in the, the U.S. public and indeed the public around the world accessing these articles. <clears throat> Torch singer voice break, there we go. Um, and what's been great about that, as well as you know, simply the success, is that having five years of data from the NIH has really informed consideration of additional open access policies outside of the biomedical science in the United States. Um, uh, not without extensive debate and discussion, for sure. In the, the time that the NIH policy has been in place, we've had this incredible set of public comment sessions, congressional roundtables that have been convened, interagency working groups talking about open access policies, briefings, hearings, stakeholder meetings, all the kinds of things that you really need to do to advance policies um, here in the United States, but that are time consuming and uh, uh, can, can drive things off the rails, actually, um, when lots of stakeholders with disparate interests get involved. It's important to do it, but in the sort of intervening time since the NIH policy has been in place, those discussions have led to, I think, a lot more tension of sort of push and pull, um, rather than it seeming like a no-brainer idea that everyone deserves access. There's been pushback by folks who have vested interests in keeping gates around, uh, particularly articles reporting on funded research, because they have a financial interest in it, and that's in particular commercial journal publishers. So there have been legislative attempts to overturn the NIH policy um, and to prohibit other policies like it from being uh, enacted in other disciplines, as well as attempts to extend the NIH policy. And a considerable number of them, right? This isn't just one-offs. So this is something that's been a, a really hot policy area with lots of activity in the United States. And I'll, I'll um, conclude the rest of my remarks by talking just for a little bit about the current landscape, what things look like right now in the U.S., where things are live. Um, that, that extensive discussion, the legislative attempts, uh, the conversations with stakeholders have, have really percolated to the highest level of the U.S. government. And in February of last year, the Obama administration uh, stepped in to the fray and issued an executive directive that essentially said, look, we're coming down. Um, as an administration uh, supporting expansion of NIH-like policies to all other federal, and this is science agencies, and that's actually not correct, it's uh, federal agencies that support research. Um, so agencies that are covered by this are, are not uh, NSF and uh, NASA agencies alone, but also the National Endowment for the Humanities, IMLS, the Smithsonian, um, institutions that fund research of all stripes. And it's very interesting because I think the, the Obama administration also initially used the word science to qualify research when they were talking about this directive. When the directive was issued, agencies like the NEH called and said, you know, what does a research, what does a, a research institution have to do to qualify to be a part of this? You know, why isn't humanities research considered in the same breath? And I give the administration um, all the credit in the world because they immediately went, well, you should be, and there was no, no argument, no question. Um, and the, the Obama administration, I think, of particular interest to the, the evolution and the building a framework of OA policy here in the United States, used the language, continued to build on 
the language from the OMB circular, from the policy constructs that the NIH policy is built on, and actually said in the materials that support the directive um, that they are committed to the proposition that citizens deserve access to the results of research their tax dollars have paid for, and that the, these policies will do all of the things that uh, 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 we described earlier as uh, desirable outcomes, accelerate uh, breakthroughs, innovation, promote entrepreneurship, as well as economic growth. And as I said, the directive applies to um, more than 20 U.S. federal agencies and, de and departments. And it also applies to outputs of research, including data, as well as articles. So it builds on the precedent set by the NIH policy in terms of U.S. policy applying to um, articles and data. In terms of articles, the policy, um, I don't know if folks are really familiar with the terms green and gold, but there's sort of two routes to uh, enabling open access to articles. One is called the green route, which is made, making articles available like the NIH does through an open digital repository. And one is sort of termed the gold route, which is publication in an open access journal. Um, and the, the open access policies in the United States, the directive, the NIH policy, what agencies are discussing are almost uh, completely focused on enabling the green road, accessibility through a digital repository. They don't discourage publication in open access journals, but they're not um, very strong on actively promoting that as a solution, which can be a pro or a con. Um, there's lots of, of discussion going on uh, about that. And I know we'll hear more from both Dominique and Michael uh, about uh, the differences in, in Canada and in Latin America here. Um, but what essentially the, uh, the, the, NI, the NIH, the, the White House directive does is build on the NIH policy and asks for articles to be made accessible through repositories. It, it also doesn't ask for articles to be made immediately available. Um, it uses a 12-month embargo where publishers can have an exclusive distribution period as a guideline uh, and suggests that the articles be made, no, be made available no later than uh, 12 months after publication. Um, and it does require all kinds of, of other elements that we think are important in open access policies, but haven't really been enacted fully yet so that we're, we're very grateful to see this language being explicitly called out in the directive. Um, talking about ensuring interoperability of articles. We don't just want standalone articles that can be read one by one. We want articles that can be fully linked, uh, data mined, text mined, used as digital data. And uh, requires that these articles be available not just for this generation of researcher, but also for uh, generations of researchers to come uh, by requiring long-term preservation strategies. And in terms of data, um, uh, we see sort of similar uh, uh, constructs, but not as much detail. I think the, the uh, evolution of data, open access to data policy in the U.S. is still uh, in a less granular developmental phase, if I can, if I can say that, um, uh, than uh, access to article, uh, policies for access to articles. So the guidelines in the, the White House directive regarding data are a little more broad, right? They were asking researchers to maximize access, to take steps to protect privacy, confidentiality, balancing costs and benefits. Um, and they essentially center around requiring researcher-driven data management plans. It's very much a loose community standards, bottom floor up uh, policy kind of approach for the data portion of the show. And I think that that's fine, that it doesn't look identical to the evolution of article policies. Because at some point in the not too distant future, we're going to see these two approaches you know, beginning to come, beginning to merge. And I think uh, each uh, set of uh, participants, folks who are depositing articles, folks who are creating data, are going to take elements of um, what's working the best in each policy environment and begin to, to cross-pollinate uh, those, uh, those policies. The White House Directive left lots of room for interpretation um, from the community and from agencies as to how they will go ahead and implement their policies. And additionally, the directive is regulation, not legislation. So there's really no consequence if an agency does not uh, come out with a plan. That said, almost all of the agencies that were covered have submitted plans to the White House. They submitted them last summer. They've been reviewed not only by OSTP, the, the office that requested the plans, but also by the Office of Management and Budget. 
and we're seeing um, roughly four types of um, models emerging from the agencies, some that are following the NIH, some that are sort of growing their own and adapting their own databases into uh, PubMed Central like models. We're seeing commercial publishers really attempt to continue to assert control um, by offering solutions and some federal agencies will be piloting solutions with publishers and some are sort of picking and choosing uh, pieces from each of these these models and um, and uh, uh, creating hybrid uh, solutions. So much of the activity in the United States now and for the foreseeable future will be centered around the interpretation, implementation, and ultimately the legislative codification, right? Making this regulation into law um, of the White House directive. And we'll, we'll definitely see the most activity over the next several years in the area of really arguing over embargo periods, what's the correct embargo period, if any, and what are the right reuse rights for articles and data. And the details of these two things will matter a great deal. In terms of embargo periods, they were accepted as a transitional mechanism to move us to a fully immediate, on day one, open access uh, uh, research environment. And so the question that we'll be asking ourselves over the next several years in the US open access policy is when is the right time to transition to a zero embargo period? And in terms of uh, reuse rights, um, think about the differences between what you can do with digital articles and digital data if you're allowed to download that articles in bulk versus just download them one by one to enable computational analysis of articles rather than simply say in a policy, analyze articles. Right, these little tiny words in the US policy environment is where the rubber's gonna hit the road and is hitting the road. Um, and where I'm realizing I'm, I'm, there's like th three words that matter on these slides. And that's what's going to comprise the, the lion's share of people who are working in, in this policy arena's lives for the next you know, five or six years. The out, it, it seems like such tiny, tiny details, but the outcomes can be um, uh, really significant. And I'll just close here by noting that there's lots of legislation on the table that attempts to codify this White House directive in one direction or another, um, from legislation like FASTER, which would shorten the embargo period and really work to get reuse rights, productive reuse rights on the table, to the legislation on the bottom called FIRST that would extend the embargo periods out to three years um, and remove deposit requirements and really, really be restrictive on reuse rights. The action is not limited uh, in terms of legislation to the federal arena in the United States. We have legislation um, proposed in Illinois, California, and also pending here in New York um, on open access to the results of research um, uh, outputs. And it's interesting to note that all three of those proposed state builds, uh, bills are built on the framework employed by the NIH policy by the, the first piece of legislation it's trying to move towards open access and the White House directive. And this is the first time that the United States in our history has had active, coordinated, open policy proposals for articles and data in play at the executive branch level, in Congress, and at the state level. And all of these are based on that consistent, focused policy framework. Uh, so an exciting time here in US policy with a lot of details, and I look forward to, to hearing my colleagues speak and to delving more into the details in the Q&A. Thank you very much. So um, my presentation today will cover two aspects of open access in Canada. I will offer an overview of Synergies, the Canadian Information Network for Research in the Social Sciences and Humanities, which was a large-scale infrastructure funded by the Canada Foundation for Innovation in 2007 for five years, which was intended to provide the means for the electronic dissemination of research in Canada. I will then present the position of our leading funding agency, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, and the position of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, for which I chair the Research Dissemination Advisory Committee. 
The Federation in Canada is the national voice and public advocate for the scholars, student, and practitioner in the humanities and social sciences. And its membership comprises 82 scholarly associations, 80 institutions, and six affiliate organizations, which represents over 85,000 researchers, educators, and students across Canada. So first, about synergies. This project was intended to fill an important gap in digital publishing in Canada by being the first sustainable, open e-publication infrastructure for the Academy, with the first goal being to offer digital publishing services prepared to international standard with the lowest cost possible for the editorial production on the on one side, and also to provide a new web interface and tools for accessing information produced by researchers in the social sciences and humanities in Canada. Canadian researchers, it was deemed at the time, required two research communication services that could be provided within one infrastructure. The first is an accessible online Canadian research record. The second is access to an online publication service that would place their work on record and would ensure widespread and flexible access. Synergies provided both of these functions. It was built on the foundation of Erudi, a Quebec-based research publication service provider in existence since 1998 in Quebec, based at the Université de Montréal, and also the Open Journal System from the Public Knowledge Project, based at Simon University, which is an online journal publishing software which is now used by over 10,000 journals worldwide. And the additional expertise developed by its three other partners, the University of Toronto, University of Calgary, and the University of New Brunswick. Synergies integrated the work done within its five-party consortium to create a decentralized national platform for social sciences and humanities research communication. Other formal synergies collaboration included Canadian research group, such as the Electronic Text Culture Lab at the University of Victoria, led by Ray Siemens, and its uh, research project called Implementing New Knowledge Environment. Other partnerships included content providers and academic publishers, such as the Open Access Athabasca University Press, the Electronic Text Center at the University of New Brunswick, and the University of Toronto Press. At its first level, Synergy thus consisted of a five-party consortium that provided a fully accessible, searchable, and decentralized national social sciences and humanities database of structured primary but also secondary social sciences and humanities text. This distributed environment was technically complex to implement and represented a major political and social collaboration which attested to the project's transformative dimension for Canadian social sciences and humanities research and researchers in general, and to the value of technological changes for social changes. The project was thus intended to be not only a pan-Canadian technical infrastructure, but also a mobilizing and enabling resource for the entire scholarly community of Canadian SSH researchers in embracing the whole of the social sciences and humanities, the project fostered cross-disciplinary, problem and issue-oriented research, while also allowing research that can be time-frame or discipline-based. It thus served to modernize the research communication tools in Canada and embraced emergent research practicing by utilizing existing text, but also enriching and expanding and easing access to scholarly data and to audiences. It further provided deeper organizational capacity for what was until then a very fragmented research record, ensuring and enhancing access to existing data set. Cognizant of ongoing development in journals, CVIS and institutional publishing, Synergies brought together librarians in their role both as information system creators and providers of access to information resources, but also journal representatives and scholars from various disciplines who were attuned in their research foci and methodologies to the changing dominant information technology and architecture 
of the scholarly world and of society in general. The fundamental restructuring of the research record represents a vast modernizing opportunity that is a necessary step forward given the ever-increasing dominance and enabling feature of the digital media. The project thus wanted to keep Canadian research in the mainstream of global and domestic research information flows in order to facilitate representational flexibility and emergent research questions, but also to provide access to match those of other information-producing nations. It presented a resource for developing advanced tools that are in high demand in all sectors of our knowledge economy. New discoveries, the development of new product, and, ac and ac access to a large corpus of data bring prestige to social sciences and humanities fields and attract graduate students and other researchers. The breakthrough thus to be expected in large-scale digital humanities such as synergies are to be first found in the reorganization and increased ease amount of access, in open access in particular, to existing print literature. Thus, from the beginning, the project was intended to break down existing boundaries between university researchers and the general public, whom the university researchers ultimately serve. As an open communication system, the network allows all individuals and organizations, regardless of geographic location or language, to build communities around their areas of interest. This opportunity constitutes the basis of the democratization of knowledge and research as a development of a citizenship based on knowledge and information. A project like Synergies was thus meant to ensure that Canada remain one of the leaders in the knowledge economy at the national and international level. These areas and nations that have moved to online publications have seen the prestige and usefulness of their scholarship flourish. Thus, our Canadian network promoted a knowledge-based citizenship which would carry over to the administrative and social institutional levels, which means that it will continue to bring forth innovative modes of organization and cultivate a fluidity and transparency in its communication. What makes it all the more valuable is that we are dealing rather with a social process for constructing organization that cannot be achieved through legal fiat. The collaborations among 22 universities involved in the project, institutions that are normally in competition with one another, inevitably led to the strengthening of collaboration between scholars, public, but also parapublic national organization. More than just benefiting present day research, the organization of data within the synergies infrastructure was also standardized for use by future research initiatives. Academic communities in Canada and elsewhere thus have access to content that was previously unavailable or obtainable only with great difficulty. More importantly, as an example of positive technological change, a project like Synergies was also meant to allow researchers to ask new questions, to draw on previously inaccessible information sources, and to disseminate the result to a much broader range of knowledge user. Synergies was funded in part, as I mentioned, by the Canada Foundation for the Innovation, but also by our main leading council, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. So bringing forward in the fall of 2013, so just a few months ago, the National Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, which is our science branch, and the Social um, Sciences and Humanities Research Council, invited associations and individuals to respond to a document entitled Drive Tri-Agency Open Access Policy. The document, as the agencies indicated at the time, was based on the promise that making research results as widely accessible and accessible as possible is an essential part of advancing knowledge and maximizing the benefit of publicly funded research for Canadians. As major funders of research and scholarship in the higher education sector, both the Science Council and the Social Sciences and Humanities one have a fundamental interest in ensuring, just like in the United States, that the result of publicly funded research 
are broadly disseminated, enabling other researchers as well as policy makers, private sectors, and not-for-profit organizations, but also the public at large, to use and build on this knowledge. With the intent of keeping with global trend on open access, both councils thus made public a draft policy that would require federally funded peer-reviewed journal publication to be made freely available within one year of publication. That draft, obviously, is modeled after our own Canadian Institute for Health Research, which has had a similar policy for a few years, but also in an attempt to harmonize you know, other international research funding agencies in Australia, the United States, or the European Union. Clearly, that consultation and a draft policy that is being revised and will be made available publicly in the fall of 2014 was but, was but one more step in the ongoing issue of implementing open access policy, since both agencies have been looking into that issue for quite some time and have recognized that the trend towards open access involves both <laughs> challenges and implication for a broad range of, of stakeholders. The consultation was thus intended to foster open communication and sharing of the full range of issues and concern, especially around the most appropriate mechanism to support and facilitate the transition towards open access. As you know, the rationale for open access to scholarly material is grounded in a belief that university-based research and scholarship represent a public good which freely draws on the work of others from its production and thus will in turn be freely used by others to build on that knowledge. This is especially true for works produced with public fund when there is a legitimate expectation that having underwritten the majority of the research cost, the public should freely access its results. This is critical for research in the social sciences and humanities, most of which is obviously very interesting to and understood by the broader public, not simply narrow circles of specialists. Thus, open access is rooted in the scholar's own desire for a great readership and maximal impact. Most academics, truth be told, have little expectations of making money from journal articles and only somewhat more from monograph, unless you know, it's a textbook. So they weight their remuneration, their remuneration rather in terms of citation, promotion, and tenure decision, as well as profile and general prestige. Open access maximizes a scholar's readership and research impact, since indeed open access literature is more highly cited. The concept of open access is broadly understood as scholarly literature, largely based on the work published in peer-reviewed journals I've mentioned, that is digital, online, and free of charge for anyone with an internet connection to use. It thus seeks to take advantage of the reduced distribution cost associated with online publishing while shifting the remaining cost away from the end users by using one or more alternative ways to finance the still rather considerable cost of production. While free of cost to the user, scholarly literature is by no means cost-free to publish. Thus, open access democratizes the, the dissemination of knowledge, particularly for researchers and students working in developing countries. It removes the particular financial barriers associated with journal subscriptions, electronic information that can fulfill the promise it holds to make knowledge more accessible throughout the world. As the voice of the research community in Canada, the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences had previously indicated support the principle of an access by signing the Berlin Declaration in September 2011, but also already five years earlier in 2006, when its General Assembly adopted the following seven principles. One, that open access must be promoted, incremental, and flexible rather than mandated. Two, that the scholarly contribution of open access and self-archive research may be best, better measured and recognized. Three, 
that the need for education and resource development to assist scholar in the transition is you know, put forward, and that the financial viability of association and journal must also be ensured in a transition to a full open access. In that sense, the Federation also encouraged publishers to, endure, to end, adopt policies that supported self-archiving. And finally, it also underscored the need not only to make access to information, but also to make sure that it was implemented with international standards of metadata. As a member-based organization of scholarly associations and universities, the Federation represents the large interest of these organizations, and it has, over the past decade, you know, seen the way that the community has experienced what we've called a serial crisis, resulting from unsupportable price increase of scientific journal subscriptions and the growing concentration of large international commercial publishers in the journal market. At the same time, technology progressed to allow the opportunity to disseminate research electronically, making possible unprecedented level of access. In 2004, the Social Sciences and Research Council as well took the position of supporting open access in principle, and it did so in order to guide the development of its research support programs and help move the result of publicly funded research in that field more broadly throughout the world of research and into society. It then went on with a series of consultation with the research community, and in 2006, approved a policy on open access that was meant to, quote, an awareness-raising educational and promotional approach to implement an open access policy rather than, at that time, imposing mandatory requirements. The following year, in 2007, to facilitate the transition to open access publishing model, the Social Research Council held a successful pilot competition for open access journal funding opportunities, and the following year, it fully invited application for financial support from Open Access Journal through its aid to scholarly journal funding opportunities. By the time of the 2011 competition, the competition runs every three years, more than half of the applicants had an open access or delayed open access business model. I will add that on the journal side in Quebec, for the past decade now, the lead funding agency there, the Fonds de Recherche Québécois Société Culture, has mandated that all journals funded by that funding agency be published in the platform RUD, mentioned before in connection with Synergies, which has a policy of a delayed access of two years for some of its publication, but at present has over 90% of its content in full open access. RUD is quite unique in Canada for aggregating content and distributing it, but also partially commercializing it. It is the only Canadian consortium that currently sells Canadian content to Canadian universities through the Canadian Research Knowledge Network and to institutional abroad through subscriptions. It currently includes 87 peer-reviewed journals, 20 cultural magazines, thesis, proceeding, and repositories for other materials such as grey literature, which are usually difficult to find. And RUD is built in an interesting hybrid business model, combining free and filtered access and generating reviews that are redistributed to journal editors. Productions there occurs in a centralized and controlled environment of digital content in high quality formats, that is to say, a rigorous and consistent markup that is key to the workflow, enabling a rather important range of downstream functionality and archival opportunity as well. So moving back to 2013 and the draft agency put forward by the, the Social Research, Research Council, the key component I would like to sort of underscore here is that at present, the draft would require grant recipients to ensure that any peer-reviewed journal publication arising from agency-supported research are freely accessible within 12 months of publication, either through the publisher's website or an online repository, hence the green you know, road that Heather mentioned before. 
The draft policy also included a set of principles that guided the agencies in promoting open access to research publications, namely a commitment to academic freedom and the right to publish, the desire to maintain high standard and quality of research by committing to academic openness, integrity, and ethics. It also wanted to promote and recognize the research best practices and standard across disciplines and embraced and shared emerging practices and standards. Also, in order to advance academic research, but also be an effective diffusion of research results. Following the invitation by the Council to comment on the draft, the Federation made a series of recommendations which I believe will strengthen the policy by integrating a series of extra measures, and time will tell in about six months how much these were taken into account, but the Federation wanted to insist that the agency should require deposit upon acceptance in an institutional repository or open access repository with full metadata, having proper metadata being indeed a key component to ensuring accessibility and visibility. That the agency should go beyond that journal article to also include individually authored chapters in collection of essays. That in order to increase the grant reporting aspect, the CV, we have to use a common CV in Canada, would actually require uh, researchers to indicate the URL of you know, that repository. And also making sure, as a very important aspect, that the long-term preservation and persistence of content be a priority at the time when research output is increasingly only available in digital format. So in conclusion, I would like to state that for us in Canada, the fundamental restructuring of the research opportunities is a great moment that is a necessary step forward given the ever-increasing dominance and enabling features of the digital media. As the knowledge economy becomes ever more pervasive, Canada and other countries need to maintain their competitiveness. And social sciences and humanities research have been often at the forefront of that new knowledge economy and should continue to be at the cutting edge of knowledge mobilization. With a series of change to forms and models of publication, the way that information is created, shared, and consulted has undergone some fundamental changes in the last two decades. I wanted thus today to draw and we think about the ways that technological changes continue to impact social sciences and humanities researchers, but also the public at large through the reconfiguration of the creation and dissemination of, but also access to, research produced in Canada. Ultimately, the latest change in policy are very likely to have, in my view, a very major and positive impact on open access in my country. Thank you. Latin America is a region where research and research publication is mainly government funded. Publishing is undertaken by the scholarly community. It has not been outsourced to commercial publishers. This has contributed to the development of a regional ecosystem of shared information resources in local language, Spanish and Portuguese in local and regional publications that usually lack international visibility and access to participate in the global conversation of science. In some disciplines, a high percentage of research output is published in English in international journals, which is highly valued in the evaluation process of researchers, but in this case it lacks regional visibility and access for non-subscribers 
to commercial databases and non-English speaking, which are both frequent situations. Research output from countries is measured out of a set of journals indexed by Web of Science or Scopus. Only a very small percentage of peer-reviewed journals published in Latin America are included in those indexing services. A presence that has only improved slightly in the past decade, according to a recent study by Juan Pablo Alperin from the Public Knowledge Project. Internet, the web and open access have provided the region with a unique opportunity to increase visibility and access to its research output. Open access has been increasingly incorporated into the publishing practices and policies have promoted building lists of quality journals within some countries and participating the, each country in regional non-commercial databases that act as platforms to help journals have online visibility professionalize the production of journals and receive open access indicators. The main non-commercial databases in Latin America developed with, with public funds are Latindex, located at UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Latindex is a directory with basic description of journals from the region. It reports 2,662 quality journals in the region, compared with 1,800 in the International Directory of Open Access Journals. Nearly half of these journals are from Brazil. From the 2,662 registered in Latindex, approximately 1,500 journals are available in open access in two regional non-commercial databases and publishing platforms, Cielo and Redalic, both supported with public funds. Open source software solutions, in particular the open journal system, have played a crucial role in open access publishing of individual journals as well as journal collections. We see here three main research universities from Latin America, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and the University of Chile, who have each of them a collection of more than a hundred journals published by the university in the OGS platform. In Latin America, a region where we share two languages, Spanish and Portuguese, and we share many problems which need research input, open access builds upon a long-standing tradition of cooperative information system, many of them promoted by, by the United Nations organizations some decades ago. Here are examples of regional bibliographic information systems from the 70s and 80s that today are becoming subject repositories, adding full texts. More than half a million full texts today contributed by national focal points. In this past decade, slowly, we see a growing number of digital repositories, which started first for theses and journal articles. And we see growing collections of other formats with research results. As an example, in Claxo Social Science Digital Repository, books in open access are a very important collection. To promote regional cooperation among these digital repositories, the Inter-American Development Bank and Red Clara, which is the Latin American Cooperation of Advanced Networks, have promoted the creation of national systems of digital repositories. And two years ago started a Latin American Federation 
with those national system of digital repositories as members. The project is called La Referencia. Members of La Referencia are the national networks of digital repositories. Nine countries are already members of La Referencia and a regional harvester started a few months ago. La Referencia is part of the project of international relations of COAR, the Confederation of Open Access Repositories with Latin America. As has been explained in the literature, success of institutional repositories is related to strong mandates, as is the case of the mandate of the University of Liège that links deposit with the evaluation process. In Latin America, the open access policy are mostly recommendations of open access, more than mandates. The exception and what is outstanding in the region is the political decision to have national open access legislation approved in support of the green open access road. In contrast of very few weak and partial institutional policies, with the exception, as an example, the University of San Pablo, which has a mandatory institutional rep policy with very few other universities. In contrast with institutional repositories, we have national legislation that has recently been approved by Congress in Peru, Argentina and Mexico and is still in debate in Congress in Brazil. In all cases, legislation is in support of the creation of open access repositories for government-funded research results. How is the process of open access policies? in countries. As an example, here I describe the case of Argentina, where open access legislation has been, has been drafted by the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation by an expert comi experts committee of which Claxo is a member together with universities and other research funding and uh, research organizations. The legislation has been approved last year. The implementation pro is in process. It requires developing interoperable, institutional, individual and cooperative repositories. It is interesting that the Ministry promotes the gathering of several universities in geographical locations to work together institutional repositories and share experience, training and resources. The maximum embargo allowed by legislation is six months except when previous agreements are done with uh, publishers and five years embargo allowed the maximum for data. In the case of Argentina, the implementation of the national policy is responsibility of the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. They have invited an expert com experts committee which had the responsibility to draft the legislation to adapt the international standards, make definitions, prepare guidelines and today the Experts Committee approves the requests for financial support from the Ministry and makes recommendations for the improvements of the proposals. All digital repositories, institutional repositories that are accepted in the national system of digital repositories can benefit from funding, from training and technical support. This national system is 
part of the activities for the Open Access Week of the National Harvester and the participation in La Referencia and COAR. In last year gathering of 23 countries at UNESCO Consultation on Open Access, we have recommended for both the green and the gold road of open access that shared and cooperative alternatives are prioritized. More than an APC model for countries where APCs many times are equivalent to several months salary of a researcher, taking out of research budgets amounts of money much needed for research. This regional strategy is in line with the Latin America Regional Open Access Declaration issued in Bahia, Brazil, nearly a decade ago, where a call on all stakeholders in the international community was made to work together to ensure that scientific information is openly accessible and freely available to all. But at that time, the region did not imagine that a new enclosure was ahead, this time from within open access, with APCs, Article Processing Charges. Recently, I have seen the announcement of an Open Access International Congress in Asia, anticipating, I quote, to discuss open access publishing as a global industry with key focus on Asia as an emerging market." Closing quote. So that is what we still are, interesting markets to sell products. Why can't we build upon the 70% of open access world journals which do not charge APCs and open access digital repositories. It is the responsibility of the global scholarly community, funding agency and governments to make numbers, estimate costs of a global business models with APC journals. It is irresponsible to go forward with no global numbers. Waivers is not a long-term solution. So here are some of our present challenges in the region, mainly the tension between local and global, the needs for participating in quality open access developments, and changes, changes in the way we evaluate research output. Here, the opinion of a senior researcher from Flaxo, Ecuador. He is a specialist in urban development and was counselor of Quito. He wrote 12 books, edited 22 books and wrote more than 250 journal articles. It is Fernando Carrion. He said last week, Today, academics from Ecuador try to walk under the journal's culture that will have little impact on the knowledge of our reality and, instead, will have high impact aimed at satisfying external markets and personal egos. How could the global scholarly community take back ownership of scholarship communications to build a global participatory and inclusive ecosystem of scholarly communications managed as a commons. We need to think who is being included and who is being excluded in the scholarly communication systems we design, as John Wilinski recently said in Poland in a meeting about open science. We do not know yet how open access scholarly communication will look like in the future, but we can promote from now on a knowledge commons approach. To manage open access within the scholarly community as a commons may be less utopian than thinking that we can cover the cost 
of a global APC model with full participation of developing regions. In developing regions, we have basic health services free for the citizens, we have basic education services free for the citizens, so we can secure basic open access free for users, free for publishing. How to build it? Through research, interoperable digital repositories at institutional, national, regional, international and thematic level. On top of that, paid value-added services can be organized by publishers, journal portals, mega journals, epi journals, data portals, impact services, etc. Our congratulations to Columbia University Centers for Digital Research and Scholarship, part of Columbia University Libraries Information Services, for being a key player in building the North America Shared Access Research Ecosystem, which is a building block for this concept of global open access as a commons. Sasan, yes, yes, great. So I'll invite our, all of our speakers to come up to the table and thank you all for such really great presentations and giving us this, this really robust, robust picture of what's happening, happening across our uh, hemisphere. So now we open things up for uh, Q&A. Um, and just a reminder, we have a microphone that's coming forward for anyone that would like to ask a question. I also want to encourage those who may be following the webcast to submit questions via our, uh, our hashtag, and we invite your, uh, your input as well. So um, we have a question right here, and if you can just hang on for the mic. Oh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, well, there's been some discussion today about the relationships between the publishers and the authors and the readers, but as we know, the system has evolved over centuries uh, where we also have uh, the academic promotion process involved. And uh, in light of, for example, the goal of zero embargo time, what are the implications that that, that would have for this, the current promotion process and how might that evolve so that uh, recognition could be balanced with uh, the ability to publish uh, uh, in a, uh, a way that uh, reaches the greatest uh, number of readers and at the same time is a contribution to scholarship. Maybe I'll just start. Um, yes, it's a very important question and one that ideally should be better interlinked between um, sort of uh, institution-based policy on that and the delay between the change even in the uh, humanities particular disciplines of the article versus the monograph and the kind of lagging time of adjusting to the reality of the market. You know, one doesn't publish as ever good your monograph is today as it was 10 years ago for other financial constraint. So that we can see a slow shift to that. And I think in that sense, in the States, the MLA has been quite, you know, sort of important in encouraging change to tenure and promotion uh, reviews, not only for publication, like we've talked about in general articles, but even different forms of scholarly output like blog entries or Wikipedia you know, uh, entries, other ways of sharing information from the scholar's perspective with the greater public that should still be taken into account for that. There's a bit of a lag, uh, but I'm sort of quite optimistic that it's being you know, sort of seen in part because now obviously we see suddenly as both of us mentioned, uh, funding agencies you know, sort of making that a, a very relevant topic. Um, so I think the pace is going to increase for that to be sort of taking into account. I, I also think the, um, the measures are changing and that's going to be an important um, driver for encouraging change um, in tenure promotion uh, evaluators behavior and the folks who are being evaluated. With open access, we're seeing a greater, um, uh, an emergence of 
uh, measures with greater granularity, right? That can can not just track the impact uh, of the, the sort of aggregate of citations measured by an impact factor that is sort of the current uh, currency of the realm, but also measures that can um, be interpreted and put into context in a much broader way. So not only how many people are, are reading and downloading the work that you're doing, when are they looking at it, but being able to dig in um, uh, to different aspects of who's looking at your work, examining social media conversations about whether it's a monograph or a piece of work or an article, um, and looking at the identity of who's using their, their, your work, uh, the geographical location and distribution of the interests in your work, all kinds of uh, different measures that will be able to paint a much fuller picture of the robustness of the impact, and the word impact writ large, of, uh, of the works that we're creating. And I think that's a very exciting um, piece of the puzzle to, to think about. Um. D Dominique, welcome. Um, did you want to respond to that? Did you hear the question? Yes, yes. Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Good. Other other questions? Hi, I'm Alex Hill. I'm the Digital Scholarship Coordinator here at Columbia, and I had a question of, uh, about data. And uh, I know I was mentioned in the beginning, but uh, uh, the focus was mostly on uh, journals and journal articles as as an assumed form, the, as the assumed form of scholarship in the 21st century. When uh, I'm starting to see many other genres kind of crop up on the scene because of the affordances of the digital. Uh, so I, I that of course is going to present many many problems uh, of discoverability in the in the future uh, and interoperability. Uh, it, mostly because a lot of these things are self-published sometimes. And, uh, so I was wondering if you guys can make any comments about uh, the relationship between uh, um, your initiatives and the government policy to self-publishing and the process as we call it and and data. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll jump in again. Um, so I'm thinking also about data in, in terms of the way that SHRC, the, the, the Social Humanities Research Council, has also been thinking as a kind of step-by-step. Step. They've already announced that they will be reviewing after journal publication um, the monograph, you know, kind of aspect uh, and ways to promote open access monograph publication. But then um, data sets and the uh, requirements at their end to make these data sets available in the same way that other forms of publications are traditionally associated with you know, research output are made because of exactly what you said, the need for having the data, not only for collaborating research the way sciences have done in the past, but the awareness of the reusability of that data sets for other people. Um, the main crux in Canada really is all the questions of kind of confidentiality of, you know, sort of the way that the data was sort of produced and other aspects. So this is a bit more murky at present, and that's why they're not, have, you know, kind of draft policy. Um, but they are very much aware of it because when they made it, just like Heather mentioned earlier on, when they were encouraging people to sort of do that in the, you know, sort of early 2000, they realized like 5% of the data was still in existence 10 years after being sort of funded. Um, and most researchers had their boxes of five and a quarter floppy disk in their office, which even they couldn't use anymore. So, you know, the idea was, you know, it's something had to be done. Um, but it's, it's another sort of uh, aspect uh, that's it's still quite complex, especially, as I said, from all the questions of uh, the, uh, the, the creation and use of, of data sets, including permissions and all that uh, aspect. I, I think the two questions this might seem odd, but those two questions to me are, are sort of very inextricably linked. Um, I think data will become easier to deal with and easier to use and repurpose and, and uh, sort of work with over time when it's valued more highly. And I think we're beginning to see some, um, st maybe baby steps, but steps forward in terms of the original data being used and data curation being valued as a contribution to uh, scholarship and to research. I'm thinking of a, um, you know, one project in particular in the biomedical sciences. Um, there is a project called the, the Sage BioCommons, which is actually an, um, a, a cancer drug discovery commons where researchers are, are from uh, the academy 
from commercial companies, large pharmaceutical companies, from the university community, uh, from all over, are sharing their data sets in a commons environment. And one of the things that's happening in this commons in environment is that the data are being worked on in different ways. They're either being, um, uh, the quality level is being brought up, they're being made inter to be interoperable with, with uh, data sets with one another. Uh, different types of work is being done on the data that, that actually contributes to that data, the utility of that data over time uh, to a larger community. And the folks who are doing that work annotate the data sets with their identity, with their names. And so over time, they're building a trail of work that can actually be followed and that can be valued by people who say, look, this person is an amazing you know, curator for this particular aspect of data. It's not a, an, a, a layer of work in the scientific and um, uh, uh, social sciences and humanities research community that we place particular emphasis or value on now. But I think we're increasingly recognizing that as we operate digitally, as d more data is being generated and as we're all sort of throwing up our hands and going, there's just so much of it and it's, you know, it's just such a big problem, that to really attack it, we have to start from the beginning and value people who are doing good work on, it, on data, track that work, and then be able to um, reward and, and uh, um, uh, cultivate these people and these processes as we go forward. Um, I, I actually um, had a question, if I could jump in. Um, I think mostly for Michael and for, for Dominique. Um, in the United States, of course, we've seen what we could call pushback from commercial journal publishers who have been used to making fairly significant profits um, from um, being sort of gatekeepers of scholarly research. And I wondered in the um, Canadian and Latin American environments, how are commercial journal or other publishers factoring into the process of, of development um, of open access? Are, are there any alternative models that are coming out of those sectors? Maybe Dominique, if you'd care to start. Yes, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Perfectly. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, in Latin America, uh, commercial publishers uh, were not interested in taking over publishing, so we could choose open access uh, from the beginning. And uh, now commercial publishers are trying to invite us to become enthusiasts about... Uh, open access publishing, paying for uh, charges to, to publish, APCs. So this is uh, quite an issue in our region because uh, funds were for paying subscriptions, but we do not have funds to pay APCs. And as Harnad has mentioned, we still have 80% of journals for which we have to pay subscriptions. Um, in Canada, the process is a bit different in the sense that uh, a large amount of journals in the social sciences and humanities are related to associations. And these tend to get funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, which, as I mentioned in my talk in, in 2008, changed the model that it was used to do funding per cost for publishing in the traditional cost of printing, mailing, to uh, an amount, which is uh, $850, for one article. Whether it's published in electronic format or in print, in open access or in not, they move the shift to the idea that they are funding research and so if you have an open access journal, as I you know, happen to have, um, you can get money for, you know, for funding your journal that way. So that's helped a lot on the journal end. Some more obviously commercially interested in funding uh, their own association through the journals. That's when it gets a bit more complicated. That associations were benefiting from the journal to be sort of you know, getting money. So that's a big transition. The main pushback right now is probably more with mainstream publishers of books, because this is where they see there's still the bulk of the market for library you know, acquisition. And that's changing a little bit as libraries, and again, I feel a bit self-indulgent, but I run a series at the Presse Université de Montréal that has an open access component 
uh, where books are published in print, but also available in online and HTML for free, the library contributed as an experimental project funding for 10 books to be published in my series and my, my colleague Marcello Vitali Rossati and the Presidents de Montréal to shift away from the subscriptions model to pay for the production of books that will then be made available. So this is again a kind of transition moment where the main commercial presses are resisting and trying to see how are they going to remain financially viable. The associations behind the majority of journals in social sciences and humanities are happy to see the transition as long as some funding can be found. And the exploration right now is, are the libraries moving their, you know, their money from acquisition to production and con becoming partners? And in that sense, the Public Knowledge Project has been a leader in Canada for inviting libraries to, through a series of different level of membership to basically help contribute to the cost and development of their system, which, as we know, is kind of freely available in the world. So, you know, it's still very much, you know, trying to uh, tackle that issues. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, at this stage, some projects, uh, large-scale, you know, sort of a series, like University of Toronto Press, are very open to experimentation, but have, you know, sort of a, a serious interest in maintaining some form of that. But they've been very open to, you know, discussion. Um, it's just a bit more complicated, let's just say. Mm -hmm. We had a question back here. Yeah. Hi, Bob Chen from uh, Season here at the Earth Institute at Columbia. Um, I want to get back to the data question and uh, uh, kind of push further on a point I think Heather had in the early on about in her slides about uh, uh, I think it used the term licensing or open access licensing and uh, so so the more general question across the different legal um, frameworks of the different countries, sort of where you see uh, use of open access licenses going in the data realm. And just to forewarn you, I'm on the advisory board for Creative Commons, so, you know, I, I'm coming at it from a particular <laughs> viewpoint, but, you know, you can, you can uh, tell me what you think. So we'll just say CC0 and leave it at that, okay. <laughs> I, 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 totally a proponent of CC0, but see, you know, obviously complications with getting people to understand. We have a hard enough time in the article realm um, explaining the nuances of CC BY versus CC BY NC and, uh, you know, the SA acronym SUE, for those of you who are not familiar with um, Creative Commons licenses, the, the sort of gold standard um, uh, in the open access community for uh, uh, the license terms associated with article reuse is the Creative Commons attribution only or CC BY license, which essentially says you treat art articles as digital data and you can do anything you want to the digital contents of that article, remix it, uh, download it, um, data mine it, text mine it, uh, uh, repurpose it for any lawful use. The only requirement being that you have to give credit to the original author of the work. Um, and that's a tough sell uh, in, in the article world where people are concerned. The first question they usually ask is, what if I want to uh, make money off of the article? You're not prohibited by using a CC BY license to make money, but it's a, it's a complicated conversation. We start to talk to folks about licensing data sets um, and uh, use similar terminology about we want the least restrictive license in order to encourage the broadest possible reuse. We get more pushback than just, what if I want to make money um, off of a data set? We get, what if uh, I want to protect privacy? What if I am concerned over um, uh, how this, this material might be re-aggregated? The, com the complexities of the potential reuses of data, I think, are, are um, even bigger than those of articles. That said, um, Spark, as an advocacy organization, is has always advocated for CC BY as the gold standard for uh, uh, reuse of articles. And I think we're increasingly moving in the direction where the community is getting comfortable with the idea of the lowest common, the lowest barrier to reuse CC0 being something that we need to advocate for as aspirational so that the community can move along, uh, you know, at, at whatever pace the community will move along in adopting the most liberal reuse licenses. I don't know if you find that helpful at all. Rebecca wants to add. 
Canada first. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, well, it's it's different, but in some ways very similar at the same time, um, and uh, we face the same sort of hurdle. Uh, it's really more at the way that right now the main issue is most people don't ask th this kind of questions when they start collecting the data. Yeah. And the problem is like, you start collecting your data and you get your <laughs> data set, you know, but you forgot to ask the right question or to when you build up your agreement, whether it's ethic approval or other things for reuse should have been built up. So we're seeing uh, a kind of uh, awareness, you know, sort of uh, to thinking about that. And again, Shirk is trying to make that policy mandatory so that people will start from now on. Although we're talking about 2015 for journal articles and then, you know, we probably won't be seeing any of that between for another two or three years, I think, at the data set level. But they're projecting that it will then be, you know, mandatory for researchers to make all the requirements at the beginning so that they can't turn around right now and most of them will say, I never asked for reuse. You know, it was for my sole purpose. Uh, and even myself sometimes, uh, art, uh, uh, scholars have argued that they can reuse their own data for another project if it's not exactly the same, but only part of it, they will have to technically recollect the data, which you know, I'm not sure everybody does, but you know, uh, on paper it's, it's officially that way. It really is very narrowly defined at present. So they're just trying to shift that, but it's going to take a, you know, take a little while you know, in order to implement it. It's interesting because it's almost a chicken or the egg kind of a question that it's cultural practice Policy can, in some cases, give it a boost forward, but you, you have to let cultural practice catch up with policy, and then vice, you, sometimes one is leading and another is, is following. In Latin America, we need more awareness about licensing and rights. A recent study says that about 48% no, of open access peer-reviewed journals in the region are using uh, Creative Commons licenses. Uh, Rebecca, you had a uh, comment, question? It's, it's something of a, um, so you guys mentioned earlier the importance of um, getting proper reward and attribution, um, following up on your CC0 in data which would not require any kind of attribution. Yeah. Um, how, how, do you, how do you put those two together in, in reconciling uh, why you wouldn't go for a CC BY across the board? That's actually a great question, and um, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I, that's a good, yeah, <laughs> something to think about. Uh, we have a question from Twitter, actually, oh, okay. from the uh, Institutional Repository at Montana State. Um, so if promotion, uh, sorry, promotion and tenure is changing, any thoughts on where it is going? Any takers? <laughs> Anyone who wants to take that? Future vision uh, question here. Uh, I think more and more cases are sort of seeing the idea of the, the public um, utility of universities. Um, recently in Canada, Kevin Key, um, who's a, a digital humanist at Broke University, published a piece in the Globe and Mail, which is our New York Times in, in Canada, advocating um, the dissemination of research in different formats, but also uh, a better bridge between university communities and the public at large. And I think in some ways, some of the shifting aspect will be visibility, not just in the old fashioned, my colleagues know that journal and the other 12 people working in that field do as well. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, sort yeah. of what is, and so example like digital communities now are the journal that is based around blog entries that are being tweeted and reworked and commented upon get republished as a form of validation of, you know, that, that research. So alternative ways of trying to think about where you published by Cambridge University Press, or did actually somebody you know, read your book and somehow make me use of it? And again, we're back into how was that use? Was that use made through you know, citations, which we now can track much more you know, easily than before, or debate around that? So different people working around social media in universities are also trying to think of ways of having that aspect. And universities are catching up a bit more quickly there because they are defending their own turf in terms of 
their usefulness for society at large. And so not everybody will cure cancer tomorrow and people will talk about that, but if all the ways you know, to make the research produced by universities get more widely accessible, um, then that's actually going to be, I think, much more quickly adopted. I think that's exactly right. And the granularity of, of um, being able to measure public engagement on different levels, not just you know, mentions in the media, I mean, it's sort of easy to track even in a paper-based environment, but the, 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 the process of was this work picked up by um, uh, or built on by a policy-making body, that's always been sort of a long tail thing to kind of track. But now if you see somebody from the CDC tweets your work, all of a sudden you have a tangible piece of evidence that a policy, uh, 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 your work could have had some influence on a policy-making uh, body and you're able to kind of track that impact and public engagement um, in a way that we just haven't been able to do before. And it's really interesting to me that being nested in an organization that's in the library community and universities, we've been talking about open access for quite some time. And for the first sort of nine years, the phone calls that we would get from campuses were, can you come and talk about um, publishing, journal publishing, institutional repositories? There were very sort of specific questions, author rights. The last 18 months, we've gotten more questions about, can you come and talk about open access? But what we really want you to do is use the open access discussion as a hook to talk to our research administrators, evaluators, about the different opportunities now for evaluating research. And when we talk about it, it's really interesting to me that the senior administrators will all say, yeah, tenure promotion needs to be, um, needs to be changed. We're all for it. This is ex an exciting new way to do it. But, man, you've got to talk to the faculty because they're really the ones that, you know, they, they, they're, they're in control of the TNP process. And then we talk to the faculty and they say, we'd love to use these new measures, but, man, you've got to talk to the administrators because, you know, they're the ones who are really the very, and we're like, oh, to solve this, we need to put people in the same room. And just, I, I really do think that these kinds of conversations can, can uh, need to happen, and they need to happen fast. Um, Dominique, any comments on yes, the promotion uh, and tenure? So much agree with Heather and Michael about bridges we need from research to society, to policy making, and uh, in developing regions in Latin America, in any case, uh, promotion and tenure are related with the impact factor of journals. Imagine what this can mean in, as an example, in sociology, in the past five years, 80% of articles written in Argentina in sociology were published in local journals or in regional journals in local language. So the impact factor, we are trying to put forward the issue in Latin America about re rewarding quality and relevance more than impact factor and citations measured by uh, a package of journals which so poorly represents developing regions. Um, yeah, great. I was thinking this side of the room has been quiet. So I, please. I just <laughs> wanted to add, and I think you've all alluded to it, that it's wonderful to have uh, individual institutions become more enlightened about tenure and promotion policies, but I think what we really need is a national set of guidelines that can be uh, consulted and embraced and used, whether it be by discipline or whether it be more universal than that. Mm -hmm. But clearly, there's, there's no single document that, that any institution that I know of here now uh, uses to uh, inform the tenure and promotion direction uh, that is occurring at the schools. We have, uh, we have signed in Claxo the Declaration of San Francisco. It is a guideline for us. And uh, I so much agree with you that we need guidelines to distribute in universities, so to improve the evaluation of research output. Alex? Yeah, I have a question from uh, Twitter here. It's, uh, it's a little bit more specific. I know we're talking about uh, bridges uh, all across the world in, uh, in national policy. And I, I'm going to 
That's a question for Dominique from Brett Bodley over at the Office of Digital Humanities of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And uh, uh, he wants to know what, what happened, uh, what was the aftermath of Synergy? Uh, how did it fall? Uh, what happened to the data that was accumulated through it, uh, through all the different open access repositories? Did it ever? What, what happened? To all right, yeah. all right. um, well, uh, on the one hand, money ran out. Um, uh, sadly, sometimes uh, it's a reality of the ongoing uh, maintenance of such a project. Synergies, in some ways, had two goals, as I mentioned before. The, the funding was a lot behind the scenes, and its fruits are in the availability of uh, a large number in the 22 universities that participated in OGS servers, in libraries, in training sessions, and hirings of technicians to support the transition from print to electronic format. So there were two aspects. There was a, a visible window that was a, a central as access point for looking through and searching through all the journals that were indexed in that process. However, <coughs> at the same time, what happened between, and there's nothing like sort of thinking about Google, um, when we started a project in 2005, the word was not yet accepted in a dictionary as the first thing people do about anything. Um, and therefore, the idea of having a centralized you know, search interface that will allow you to look for journals <coughs> in SSH was quite you know, sort of innovative. And then they got it not only faster than we did, but with like a gillion you know, sort of more material. And what we then focused on was making sure that the data produced by Synergy journals was as widely accessible in Google and other searches. So in some ways, the maintenance of that platform felt less a priority, hence the fact that it's now a couple of years out of date. But the data behind the scene continues to be properly indexed and sort of uh, at the level of metadata and output so that it's still widely searchable and available. Um, and the other aspect that then was sort of done was thinking about the next step of that project and sort of other funding opportunities are being explored for now thinking about tools and other things. So all the journals, and you have to remember that in Canada at the time, we really had less than 15% of journals that were available in print, you know, in electronic format. So we saw the kind of the, the visible, you know, sort of um, goal of synergies in helping that transition, not doing it ourselves, but making the tools available to journals and university presses, um, you know, quite taking on. Um, so it was a kind of a two-stage aspect. So the data continues to be there. It continues to be harvested, uh, but it's done in a way that it's now much more of a kind of deep silo than a kind of public visibility because we just realized that people were getting to the data via primarily Google or libraries that also had better indexing, you know, function for all these journals. So, you know, it just multiplying entry points was not as, you know, relevant. So the, most of the funding was then sort of focused on continuing that harvesting. <laughs> um, I actually had another question, if I may, not to. Uh, I, I, it's so tempting to have uh, Dominique on hand for me to ask questions about Latin America that I can't resist. Um, Dominique, you mentioned that many countries now have um, passed legislation that would um, require deposit of um, government funded research. And in many ways, Latin America is, is a leading region uh, in, in the overall open access movement. Um, I wondered about the difference between this uh, legislative framework and the actual compliance with carrying out um, what the legislation is asking. And I ask this because there have also been um, some countries that are passing freedom of information to government information laws, but there are some concerns about the challenges between having such laws and then the actual ways that they're implemented and the ways that they function in practice. So I wondered if you could reflect on on what you think are both challenges and um, mm -hmm. factors that will, uh, you know, help us see uh, these these policies actually um, operate to their fullest capacity. Excellent question, Heather, <laughs> and the most difficult to answer because uh, the legislation is quite recent. I can anticipate that we are not going to have problems with. Uh, research results published in local and regional journals, books, uh, paper conferences, because we have a culture of openness and open access. We have Cielo and Redali, we have La Refectencia, but I wonder what is waiting for us when we are going to ask commercial publishers 
to help us take back home research results which were published in their journals. I expect negotiations and uh, I expect Latin American countries to come together because, uh, as you may know, the subscription bundle prices from the countries are a secret, are not known. So I hope that uh, Latin American governments, which where legislation has been approved, will meet and will make a presentation together to the four or five big publishers, the commercial publishers, so that we can have in our region <coughs> compliance with the legislation. In Argentina, it's mandatory and it's six months. Uh, in Brazil, the legislation has not been approved, but as to have a dimension from the $80 million paid in one year from the government, 35 million went to a one only publisher. You may imagine who it is. So that's the, that's the question mark. How will be our legislation, how will be able to negotiate with the publishers, with the commercial publishers? Thanks. Um, any other last questions for our panelists? Going, going, gone? Well, in that case, I want to thank all of you for being here and also those who have joined us on the webcast and especially to thank our excellent panelists that have given us a, a very good and global uh, picture of the current status of open access. We thank you very much. Join me in thanking them. And Thanks to Cedars and the Digital Humanities Center, actually, for a full year of such wonderful programming, especially uh, Layla Williams and your uh, colleagues who have done so much work to bring this great series to us. Thank you.